this message, worship to enter in. Worship to enter in. A while ago, a couple years ago, I had a privilege of meeting a young man by the name of Sebastian Anglo Negron. And uh, I went to a conference and he was there. In fact, I got to talk with him in some detail and, and he prayed with the man that was with me for his hearing and God healed this man's hearing. But this young man had wrote a book titled Pre in Life in His Presence, A Journey into the Supernatural. And in that book, he quoted from another lady's book, Ruth Heffern's book called Glory, Experience the Atmosphere of Heaven. And it says, praise until the spirit of worship comes, worship until the glory comes, and then stand in the glory. And as I read that book, and I began to contemplate worship, and what does it really mean to worship our God? I, God began to show me the tabernacle. And I seen the outer court in my mind. I seen the inner court in my mind. Then I seen the, the most holy place in my mind. But then He began to show me the location of that tabernacle. And that tabernacle was located right smack dab in the center of Jerusalem. So everybody that come into the gates could see it. It was on the highest point in Jerusalem. So if you come into the city of Jerusalem, you could see the tabernacle sitting on the hill. And then I have had the privilege many years ago to go to Israel and take a tour. And while I was there, I wasn't even in the city. And, you know, of course, the Dome of the Rock there is now is there now. But I could see that thing probably several miles away before I ever got into the city because it was so high on this mountain. And I began to think about how many people come into that city hundreds of thousands if not millions daily or at least annually during that period of time and could see the tabernacle but never enjoyed the presence. I wonder how many people come to church on Sunday morning and see the glory but never experience the presence. I wonder how many of us think praise and worship is, not, uh, is about singing three or four songs before the preacher gets up and preaches. I wonder how many of us think our, the encounter we have with God is a goosebump. You know, I don't know about you, but when I come to church, I don't need a goosebump. I need an encounter. I need a life-changing encounter with the Holy God that we serve. I don't need just to come to church and get a goosebump and go out and think, wow, we've had a great service. I don't need that. I need something that changes my life because I know I'm not where God wants me to be. And I know that there's a long journey ahead of me. And I want to accomplish everything that God has designed for me to accomplish and purposes. And that don't happen because I trip over it and because I've had an encounter and encountered the only way to have it. And I began to wonder how many people are just satisfied with singing three or four songs. I wonder how many people can see the glory to and other people but don't have that encounter they just think it's okay you know we, we do we'll go out of church if there's not we don't have some emotional experience and we walk out of church say it was okay it was dry it was dead you know but the reality is that's because we didn't enter in we didn't enter in. We can enter in. I believe fully every day in our lives we can enter in. In fact, I believe my life and your life should be a perpetual worship service into the King of Kings. I don't care where you're at, what you're doing, who you're around. It should reflect your worship and your praise, your devotion, your love for Him and Him alone. That's what I believe. And, and I don't think we're limited on how we on where we should be we shouldn't just have to come on a sunday morning service or a wednesday service or a sunday night service or a camp meeting or a revival service to experience the presence of god he said it earlier you can be in the bathroom and god can settle down on you you can be in your truck god and he does it many times of me i'll be driving to work and i got a 30 minute ride to work and i sometimes a song get my heart and i start singing i don't sing i squeak and squawk but guess what there is a time when the presence of the living god will settle down in my truck and I can have an encounter with Him. Why? Because it's a worship. So how do we get into the presence of God? How do we get there? Because see, I don't want just to come to church. That's what I consider the city. I want to get into His presence. So Thanksgiving is the start of it. We have to be truly thankful for all His blessings in our lives. That means we must be grateful for what God has done for us. As an individual and as a corporate body, we've got to be thankful. You know, when Merriam-Webster defined Thanksgiving as a prayer or an expression of gratitude. You know, simply put, it's just a giving of thanks. Uh, you know, to get from the city, being in church, at least you start your journey in Thanksgiving. You know, in our culture, so many people think they're entitled to everything everybody else has. But look, can I submit to you that we're not entitled to any of God's blessings? Not at all. The only reason we have them is because He loves us. 
the only reason we have him because he's a good and merciful and great God and he cares about us. The only reason. And look, those people that are out in the world shooting up and snorting and drinking and cussing and ranting and raving and cheating and doing all that they do and live in these nice homes and have everything that you can dream of. The only reason is because God loves them just like he loves you. You know, it's, it's got to be more than just an experience. We've got to learn to be grateful. Truly grateful. I don't care where you live, how big your bank account is, what kind of car you drive. Be thankful for what He has blessed you with. Be absolutely thankful for what you see. See, I live in a single wide trailer, and it may not compare to what other people live in. But I'm grateful because I understand there are people that will go out into a sidewalk tonight to sleep or in a tent somewhere because they have nowhere to go. I can go to my house and pretty much, you know, pull out anything I want to eat. There are how many people don't have anything to eat or depending on someone to help them get something to eat. I, you know, I, you know, I got up this morning. How many people didn't wake up in Wayne County this morning? We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a whole lot to be thankful for. We have clothes. And for the most part, most of us are sitting clothed in our right mind. How many people are in, in mental hospitals today because something's happened so tragic they couldn't hold, their, hold it together and they lost their minds and began to have problems and issues. And now they're in hospitals and, and under psychological counseling everywhere. I got a daughter-in-law. She's 24-hour days, seven days a week. Her, uh, she's a director of admissions to a mental hospital and she's having to deal with this stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Many and thousands of people are struggling. We are got to so much to be thankful. We got to be truly thankful. You know, I may have said it before here, I don't remember, but you know, I go to say my blessing and sometimes I just say thank you for the food, nourishing my body, and, uh, you know, you know the, the blessing we say yes. with no real thought of how blessed I am to have that food. Amen. You know, without no real thought on how God blessed me. You know, I, I watched, uh, I didn't watch Bart Simpson a lot ever, really. But I flipped it through one time, the channels, and Bart Simpson was on. And it was a Thanksgiving special. And some reason, I, I don't know if i ever even seen it before until then. And they asked him to say the little blessing. And his blessing went something along these lines. God, we thank you for all this food that we got. But I don't know why we have to thank you. Because we worked and we earned it and we paid for it. You know, and I turned it immediately. Let me tell you, you got your food and you got your house and you got your car and you got gas and you got cool and air conditioning because God gave you the help to earn it. God gave you the help and strength to get to provide for it. He is your provider. We have so, so much to be thankful for. Don't take it for granted. No matter how much you have or how little you have, don't take it for granted. You know, you always heard you'll find somebody worse off than you. Don't take your blessings for granted. Because there's always somebody worse. Be thankful. So once you're thankful, where does that put you? That puts you in the outer court. The outer court. But there's not, that's, not the, that's not the destination. See, the destination is get into the inner court. Into the sanctuary where God dwells. Behind the veil. See, getting there is okay. Into the outer court. That's good. Being in church in the city, I guess, is good. But there's, there's a place we got to get to if you want a life-changing encounter. So then you begin to praise. and begin to See, we did that this morning. There was praise being lifted up. See, we went from the city, being in church, into the outer court. Now we've entered into the inner court through praise. That's where we ex we're exuberant in our praise and worship. That's where people dance and spin and shout and, and all that they do. And, and, you know, wave flags or whatever's going on and whatever they have to do, they begin to exuberantly worship or praise the king. I, one time, several years ago, uh, I, I had to go to court. And uh, I stood before the judge, never been to court before, never been in trouble before, and, and you know, never really was in trouble then, but scared to death. I just knew they were going to put me in prison for life. Scared to death. And my wife's grandfather, Mr. George, he, he said, I'll go with you, son. So we go to court. I guess he was there for moral support. And when I got in that courtroom, and you know, and I just knew this is the end of my life execution I was death row I mean I was scared to death and they finally got to my case you know and I stood up and this judge was asking me all these questions and and, and I was I was trying to answer him and didn't I was scared I'd say the wrong thing and there I'd go you know and all of a sudden he saw Mr. George sitting there and I didn't know this judge I'd never seen him before in my life he said Mr. George you with him he said yeah he said let's take a 10 minute recess come on back to my chambers I wasn't invited back. No, he was. You know, and, and uh, no, I mean, they, this judge took this man back. And nobody else went back there but him. 
and that judge. And I'm about way ahead of myself because I didn't want to tell you that part. But anyway, <laughs> so they back there and they had a conversation about me. So when it was over, everything worked out fine. It was good. But see, that's, that's, what, that's what he does. I got before that judge and I seen this man in that black robe and I knew he had all the authority and power in that room to do anything he wanted to do, say anything he wanted to say within the law. And if he said, take that person out, there was somebody going to escort that person out. If he said, tell that person to come here, they were going to that front whether they wanted to or not. Whatever, that judge had all the authority. See, when you begin to praise, you begin to see God getting a glimpse of His glory, sitting on His throne, something like Isaiah saw. So I saw the Lord high and lifted up in His glory. His train filled the temple. See, that's what Isaiah see. And when you begin to see Him, get a glimpse in that inner court of His glory and the power and the majesty of who He is, is, and you're sitting there looking at him it should bust out in spontaneous worship and praise for your king see I knew that judge had all the authority I knew that you had to be watch how you had behaved yourself in that courtroom regardless of what you're in there for but I understood also that my God is a higher God, judge than that judge and I know that when I see him when I come in this morning and he began to play that music I began to see the glory of a God that loved me and gave himself for me and set it on the throne and all power he has myriads of angels standing there waiting to do what he says. If he says go and bring that person to me, they go. There was no hesitation. There's no debate. There's no discussion. They do exactly what that king, that judge commands them to do. And see we are seeing the glory of God today. We see it. And that's where we begin. Now we're in the inner court. But then there's another place where I just kind of alluded to. When that judge asked my wife's grandfather, come back to my chambers, there's a place where it shifts. Now you're no longer seeing him sitting up on his throne, high and lifted up. Now you're being asked to come back into his, into his chambers, into the holy place, into the place behind the veil. Now this is the place where you and him are alone. There's no one else. Nothing else matters. This is the place everything dissipates. This is the fear goes away. This is where you get healing. This is where you get deliverance. This is where you get ministry to. This is where you pour your love out on Him. And He loves on you. And you begin to commune one another with one another in intimacy. It's just you and Him. And Him and you. And this is where behind the veil. They see once a year the high priest by himself could go behind that veil. Well that veil's been ripped so now you and I can go back behind that veil anytime we want to. He just says, come on, come on, come on, come on. And that happens through worship. Yes. That's where now the exuberant joy and the loud and, the, and all that. And I'm not saying you've got to be loud. If you're not loud, I'm not loud. But, you know, when, but, but when you work praise Him and you get in the inner court and then all of a sudden you begin to feel that shift and you begin to sense His presence settling down on you. There's nothing like it standing in the glory of our God. Yes. There's nothing like it at all. See, it's all about worship. See, in praise, that's where we begin to declare who God is. In praise, it says He's our shield, He's our buckler. We begin to declare His Word to Him. And, and I'm going to talk to you in a minute about that. We begin to say He is our salvation and the joy of our salvation. He is our strength. He is our rock. He is our place of refuge. He is our present help in the time of trouble. He is our God. He is our Creator. He is our Deliverer. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He is our Healer. He is our, he is our All in All. He is our King. And we begin to declare what the Word says about Him. Let me tell you when you thank him and you're thankful you're thinking about what and blessing thanking him for what he's done for you as an individual but when you begin to praise him you begin to declare who he is and you begin to speak what the word declares him to be and see and in worship you just begin to love on him and begin just to in fellowship with him one on one see our birth our worship is birthed out of relationship my, my father-in-law wasn't asked or my wife's grandfather wasn't asked back in that king's chamber or that judge's chambers just because he looked good that day. <laughs> he had a relationship with him. He knew that judge, and that judge knew him. And that judge let him go back and talk to him about me. You know, which, you know, <laughs> it could have been a life sentence. I don't know. I, it didn't turn out that way, thank God. But, but anyway, it's birthed out of a relationship. It's just you in him and in intimacy. And here's the cool thing about it. He wanted you in His presence so bad, He gave you help to get there. In, in Isaiah 57, verse 19, He says, I create the fruit of the lips. Catch that phrase. I create the fruit of the lips. And it says, Peace be to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord. I will heal him. 
Then if you go to Hebrews chapter 13 and read verses 12 through 15, it says this, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go therefore, forth therefore into him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no <laughs> continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Catch this. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. He created the fruit of your lips so you can offer it right back to Him in worship, in praise. He wants you in His presence so bad. He created it so you can get there. He fade away so you can get there and I can get there. I love it. We are commanded by God to praise Him. If we don't, we're withholding the very thing He created in our lips, in our mouth, in our ability to speak forth His praise and His glory. We're withholding it from Him. We are commanded to praise Him. Psalms 149, 1 through, and I don't have much time here, but I'm going to read, I'm not going to read it, but 149 verses 1 through 9 says this. It says, We're commanded to praise and rejoice in our God. But then it says, We are sing praises unto Him in the congregation. What did we do this morning? Amen. Exactly what we did this morning. We obeyed the Word of God. And there, see, and I told you, there's times I'm trying to, you don't have to be in a, in, in a church. You could be anywhere, anywhere, and praise Him and have Him settle into your presence. We, are, we should be joyful in our King because of His great love for us. We must. Man, if we could just comprehend just this fraction of how much He loves us, we wouldn't be able but praise Him. It don't matter how messed up we are. It don't matter how broken we are. It don't matter how, how, how far we've fallen. If we would just understand how much He loves us. Those people that I heard requesting for salvation today, you know, it's, if they could just understand the love of God for them. They wouldn't be able to resist. You cannot resist somebody who truly loves you. When you know they love you and they'll do anything, including die for you, if you really know, not just hear the words what they would do, but and know that that person would really lay down their life for you, you can't help but like that person and love that person and rejoice in that person's presence. That's what God, that's what we should do. It says it tells us to go and praise Him in the dance and the temple and heart. These guys, when they, when they play, it's anointed. And I'm not just saying this. When they play, it is anointed. Why? Because they're praising God on their instruments. The very thing God has said do. The very thing. And if you dance, I don't dance, but if you dance, dance with all your might. Dance. Don't care if anybody likes it or don't like it. Worship Him with everything in all of your strength. Worship Him. Praise Him. Honor Him. Do what the God te Lord tells you to do. Do exactly because that you're, you're not here to please people. You're here to honor Him. Focus on Him. Get your attention on Him. Get your attention and your focus completely on Him and say, God, I'm not just here to have a goosebump. I'm here to go all the way in to your presence and experience your presence. Have an encounter with you. Worship Him. See, it goes into verse 6 and this is where it blows my mind. It says, let the high praises of God be in their mouth. That happened today. But then it says, and a two-edged sword in their hand. I said, like, I'm praising you, God. I'm not out here fighting. And then it dawned on me. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And guess what? When you begin to declare what the Word of God says about Him, there is a sword in your hand and you're wreaking havoc. Read Psalms 149. I'm telling you, get home whenever, sit in that restaurant, whatever you do today, read that. You'll see. When you begin to worship Him and you begin to declare what His Word says about Him, you are got a two-edged sword and you are wreaking havoc in the enemy's camp. You are completely destroyed because here's what, I don't care how many times I say I bind you, Satan. That's my word. But if I use that, Amen. he's bound up tighter than a tick. He is messed up. Because they see, I had a man one time play the drums, and some of you musicians know, and I'm not sure all of you do this. He told me a revelation God gave him. Now, this ain't in the word, this is what he's telling me, okay? He said that when you begin to worship God and you begin to verbalize, and it's going out in the atmosphere, he said it torments Satan. And here's the reason why. If you read the Bible, I think it's in Ezekiel or Isaiah 1, it, it talks about him having the symbols in him. And, and, and the string instruments and all this stuff is in him. He was created with all this in him. Well, if you go up and throw something down heavy and it makes a loud sound, the drums begin to vibrate. The string instruments, am I correct? The piano can do it too, can it? Just from the sound waves, from that. When you create sound and worship to God, all that sound wave goes through this enemy of ours and begins to torment him. I think that lines up with this 
Psalms 149. Because see, when I begin to, to praise God, it says, it says that it will bind him up. It will bind him up with cheddar fetters of iron. It will keep him bound up in your life. You understand? He comes up and tries to bind you up with his words and his lies and his tactics and all this. All you have to do is start worshiping and you'll mess up his world. You'll torment him. You'll feel like he's already in hell before he ever gets there because of your worship. It don't matter what he brings to you. People that are dealing with sickness and disease, worship the king and watch how fast that cage is in your life because he cannot stand it. He will not stand it. It says, and then the last verse, and it says, this honor have all the saints. It ain't just the preachers, yeah. Sunday school teachers, the deacons, and all the, the elite of the elite. It is you and I, all of us, have the honor to worship God and to torment the enemy. And it actually says we can torment it, torment him just, just according to what the Word says, what it was written, how he's going to be tormented when you worship. In this passage, it says that's what you, he'll experience. What's written? When you use his word in worship, even though you may not see anything happening, you may not even feel anything happening, be rest assured that word is not returning void. It's accomplishing the very thing God said it would accomplish in Psalms 149. You're tormenting your enemy. Now, I tell you what, I don't know about you, but that's a reason to praise God just in and of itself. Because, I mean, I know the torment he put me through at times. And I love to torment him back if I can. And this gives me permission to do so. And not only permission, it commands me to do it. So let's do it. But there's some hindrances to worshiping real quick. Hebrews 11:6. Faith Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We must come before him with expectancy. It's not just coming into his presence. It's good to come in his presence. I love being in his presence. But I've got to come expecting God to do and meet my need to do what I need to be done. He said, let us come into the throne room boldly in the time of need to obtain grace and mercy. If I come in this throne room boldly and don't really expect to obtain grace and mercy, what's the purpose, purpose in entering in? Let us come with expectancy. It doesn't matter how we feel. How many times do we come to church and don't feel anything again, but yet we go out and think the service is die? It don't matter. Feeling has nothing to do with it. Because I recall about some two men that were in prison, chained, and had been beaten and chained in the dungeons, and, and they began to worship God in the midnight hour and how God delivered Paul and, and Silas and, and they set them free. And I began, I bet you right now, if you ask them, did you feel like worshiping God, it would be a resounding no. They were in pain. And they were not in a comfortable position. We're sitting on padded pews and we can stand and lift our hands and we can move around and do all this. It's easy for us in that regard. But those men were chained to walls. They were not in a very comfortable position. And besides the pain, I'm sure it wasn't easy for them to, to worship God. But yet they worshiped. And God set them free. But here's the thing. There was others that got set free. Everybody in that prison house heard them worship. And guess what? Everybody in that prison house got shut. I am convinced. I am absolutely convinced. There are people that are, their lives depend on our worship and our God. I believe there's people bound up to sit in churches every day. If someone would just start worshiping and the presence of God would fill that house and begin to set people free, it wouldn't just be the one doing the worshiping. It would be those in front. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced when I go to work tomorrow, there's someone that needs to know and hear me worship God. I am absolutely convinced of that. Because see, God set everybody free and saved the jailer. Because the two men decided to worship when it was not convenient, when it was not easy, when it was painful, they worshiped. See, again, it's not about our circumstances being just right. It is even about if they, they, if they could come in and play honky-tonk music and you can change the atmosphere by your worship Amen. because of the Spirit of God in you. I am convinced you don't have to have the right music. I am convinced it don't have to be your favorite song. I like contemporary, I like southern, I like hymns. But look, I can tell you, I can sit in my office and that girl beside me plays country music as loud as she can play it and I can still worship God Amen. because it ain't about the music. I can go into a bar and change the, change the whole atmosphere because of the Spirit of God that is in me. You have the Spirit of God in you. You can change the atmosphere. Everywhere Jesus went, the atmosphere changed. People were healed, been delivered, and set free. You have that authority because of the Spirit of God in you. It's not about the right song and the right music, whether it's your favorite song or not. It does not matter. It's not about our feelings. We've got to get past our feelings. We've got to go with faith. Sin will hinder our worship also. I know none of you ever do this, but, you know, I get an attitude once in a while. And sometimes, just something, not, I mean, you know, once, maybe a year or something, if that, you know, just once in a while, I get this bad attitude. And I'll get cranky and I'll get ill. 
and I'll smart off to somebody at work. I'll smart off to my boss. I'll smart off to the people under me. I just get, I just do it, you know. And then I feel bad, and I got to ask forgiveness. I can't worship him with something. You know, remember the scripture where God said the word says that you know, you know, if you have an odd against your brother, go and make it right before you pray. How can you how can you worship if you got if you've done something offended someone? How can you get in the presence of God if there's something in your life? How can you how can you if you know that you I mean, and I'm not talking about you. We all fall short of His glory. I mean, it, you know, I'm not talking, but I'm talking about how can we how can we get in His presence if we continue to allow sin in our lives? With sin will hinder our worship, and the very time you need to worship is the time when you really have fallen short. Ask Him to forgive you. He says. You know, ask him, say, God, please forgive me. Make it right with the people you have offended or whatever you need to do. Do it, make it right, and then enter into his presence. Because immediately once he says, I've forgiven you, I've forgotten, he's forgotten it, you can enter into his presence. But then there's sometimes, just sometimes, where, you know, you feel like you messed up and you feel so bad about what you've done, said, or whatever, and all of a sudden, you remember? I told you that you. No, you've done it now. God don't want nothing else to do with you. And, and, and he talks to you, and he talks to you, and he talks to you, and he talks to you. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling so bad. And I don't, God, I don't know if I can worship you now. But then I remind myself, there's words that I would not, brother, let you sin. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. And, and you know, and if you, can, if you confess your sin, I am faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you for righteousness. It ain't just for me to say that. Mm, because I remind of Satan what the word says. Say so he can talk all he wants to, but Satan, I may not feel it right now, and I may be feeling bad for what I've done, but I'm still going to press through and worship my King and my God, for He is still worthy, no matter how low I feel, no matter how how best messed up I've become. I, I, he is still God, and He's still worthy of worship. I press through my feelings. Never matters how you, bad you feel or how you feel. It doesn't matter if you get the goosebump. Worship. Entertainment distractions will will hinder your worship. And this world, we all know, has a lot of stuff to offer us. A lot. You know, and see, when I get off every day, like I told, them, told some people the other week, you know, when I get off, during, when I get home, I jump in my recliner, I pull that lever, I hit that button, and that TV comes on, I go brain dead for about six hours. Just love. I don't want to be disturbed. I don't want to be left alone. Eat my little supper and everything. Distractions. Well, Saturdays, I worked hard, so hard, I don't feel like getting up and praising today. I want to go out and do something. Enjoy getting out in the yard, getting out and doing, going places. You know, distractions. You know, we, you know, we got the ball games and we got the, and we got all this stuff goes on. And even church can be a distraction. You know, we got our chicken suppers and we got our this and we got our that and we got the other things going on. And so far, we get so caught up in all these distractions and nothing in of themselves are wrong. But we get so caught up in them, we fail to be intimate with Him. We're so busy serving at times, we fail to be intimate with Him. And that's His desire. You know, I mean, I'm not minimizing the need to work in the church, you know. And one brother told me today some of the things he did. I'm thinking, man, a one-man show here, you know, sound like it. But the reality is, the reality is we all need to do our part. But, but don't let everything draw you because it's a service or it's a, it's a church. You know, it's good once in a while if you take off on a Sunday and go to the what lake and rest and get and recuperate. It's all right to do these things. Everybody needs it. But don't let it become your first priority. See, Jesus in Revelation chapter 2 was talking to the church of Ephesus. And he said these words, but I have someone against you. You have left your first love. Don't let the entertainment of this life and the distractions of this life, even church, draw you away from your first love. Distractions will hinder you. But then there's another benefit to our worship as the musicians come. Just as a couple can't have a child without becoming intimate. In our intimacy with Him, dreams are conceived and birth. Did you know when you get intimate with Christ, with God, He will give you visions of where He wants you to do and accomplish. He will, he will, you will conceive things in your spirit that is an impossibility for a humanity to do and you to accomplish on your own. You will conceive great things. That's because you got to be intimate with Him. You can't just sit down and say, this thing, this thing sounds good or this thing looks good, but you begin to get that vision. Begin to get the vision of what the house is for this church and understand if that vision is birthed in intimacy with God, guess what will happen? It will come to fruition. It may take a lot of work and it may take a lot of patience, but God will bring it to pass. In His presence, healings occur. In His presence. I recall how many people, how many people were in the presence of Jesus and He healed them?
I remember the woman with the issue of blood. And when she touched to him and she was immediately healed, guess what? It no longer was the crowd around him. It was just him and her in his presence. In his presence. In intimacy, visions are given and calls are realized. In his presence, fears dissipate in intimacy with him. In his presence, the Bible declares there's fullness of joy and as right-handers.